Hello again, Psych370 students, and welcome to your first video lecture for week five. This week, we're going to be going over some of the major theories of classical conditioning, which are covered in that part of chapter three that we didn't quite get to last week. And there are four major theories that we're going to be focusing on. In this video lecture, I'm going to talk about something called stimulus substitution theory. But in my later video lectures, I'll talk about preparatory response theory, compensatory response theory, and the Rescorla Wagner model. So there are multiple theories for us to discuss here because we don't have one overarching theory of classical conditioning that fully explains it. I mean, a complete theory of classical conditioning would be able to explain and account for things like the blocking effect and overshadowing and latent inhibition and spontaneous recovery and so on, all that stuff that we talked about last week. But the reality is no such theory exists. So I wish I could just tell you definitively, this is how classical conditioning works, or this is why classical conditioning happens. Then this week's material would be much simpler and this week's lectures would be much shorter. But instead, we're gonna need to take a pretty close look at each one of these theories so we can really understand what their strengths and their weaknesses are. Okay. Well, as you might expect, the first theory of classical conditioning was developed by Pavlov himself, and it's pretty clear that Pavlov's background as a physiologist played an important role in how he understood classical conditioning. And guys, I say that because Pavlov tried to explain classical conditioning in neurological terms. He wanted to know what was going on in the brain during classical conditioning. So first of all, Pavlov basically thought that different stimuli and different responses are detected and controlled by distinct areas of the brain. So for example, when a dog is presented with food, that activates the food center of its brain. When it hears a tone, that activates a tone center in its brain. And when the salivation center of its brain gets activated, the dog salivates. So the dog has these brain centers, so to speak, that detect stimuli, and control responses. Now Pavlov further believed that some of these brain centers have these pre-existing innate connections between them. So for example, there is a natural pre-existing excitatory connection in the dog's brain between its food center and its salivation center. And so that's why food automatically makes the dog salivate even before any conditioning has occurred. That innate connection explains, according to Pavlov, why food is an unconditioned stimulus that elicits salivation as an unconditioned response. But then, of course, no such connection exists here between the dog's tone center and its salivation center, which is why the tone is initially neutral, or at least why the tone doesn't initially elicit salivation. But Pavlov also believed that during conditioning, when the tone was presented just before the food, a new connection was formed in the dog's brain between its tone center and its food center. So now, as a result of those tone plus food pairings and this new neural connection that those pairings have created in the dog's brain, now activating the tone center will activate the food center, which in turn will activate the dog's salivation center. So the end result here is that the dog will now salivate when it hears the tone. So guys, in other words, this new connection in the brain here is the neurological basis of the dog's learning. That's the change in the dog's brain that accounts for why it acquires this conditioned response of salivation to this previously neutral stimulus, the tone. So as you can see here in this theory, the only real difference between the unconditioned response and the conditioned response is how this response center, how this salivation center here comes to be activated. The unconditioned stimulus activates it through a direct connection between the food center and the salivation center, whereas the conditioned stimulus activates it more indirectly. It sort of passes through the food center on its way to the salivation center, and that's how the tone winds up eliciting this conditioned response. So guys, Pavlov's account of classical conditioning is known as stimulus substitution theory, okay? We call it stimulus substitution theory because it suggests that the conditioned stimulus 
basically becomes a substitute. It becomes a sort of surrogate for the unconditioned stimulus. In other words, because of its pairings with the food, the tone also acquires the ability to activate the dog's food center. And therefore the tone, like the food, also comes to elicit salivation, albeit again in this more indirect fashion. So that's how stimulus substitution theory works. And there's at least one major problem with stimulus substitution theory that we're going to need to talk about. But before I do that, let me introduce some concepts and some findings here that are actually consistent with what Pavlov suggested. And first of all, stimulus substitution theory is certainly compatible with a principle in neuroscience that's known as the Hebb rule. So we call it the Hebb rule, and it's named after this guy, a Canadian psychologist named Donald Hebb, who proposed it. So in this book, The Organization of Behavior, Hebb wrote the following. This is a quote from that book. He said, if a synapse repeatedly becomes active at about the same time that the postsynaptic neuron fires, changes will take place in the structure or the chemistry of the synapse that'll strengthen it. Okay, so if a synapse repeatedly becomes active at about the same time that the postsynaptic neuron fires, then changes are going to take place in that synapse that'll strengthen it, that'll make that synapse stronger. That's the Hebb rule. So we could summarize the Hebb rule like this. What it's basically saying is that when two neurons fire together, they're going to wire together. Neurons that fire together will wire together. That's the Hebb rule in a nutshell. So the connection between two neurons is called a synapse, right? And information generally travels one way across the synapse. So the neuron that sends its message out is called the presynaptic neuron. And the neuron that receives that message is called the postsynaptic neuron. So that's the one that Hebb actually references here in the quote. Well, the idea behind the Hebb rule is that if this presynaptic neuron fires, if that neuron generates an action potential, thus releasing its message and activating this synapse, so if that presynaptic neuron fires like that, and then the postsynaptic neuron fires shortly afterward, then this connection, this synapse between them is going to get stronger. And what I mean by that synapse getting stronger is that in the future, when the presynaptic neuron fires, that's gonna have a bigger effect on the postsynaptic neuron. So we'd say that this synapse here has gotten stronger if the firing of the presynaptic neuron has come to have a bigger influence on whether or not the postsynaptic neuron also fires. So that's the basic gist of the Hebb rule. Neurons that fire together will wire together, the synapses between them will get stronger. And guys, to make a long story short, there is evidence that this does in fact happen. For example, research on a phenomenon called long-term potentiation, or LTP, has found that if two neurons are repeatedly stimulated at or about at the same time, then the connection between them does get stronger. That synapse between those neurons gets potentiated, it gets strengthened, and that strengthening, that potentiation, can last for a long time hence the term long-term potentiation. So the presynaptic neuron might wind up releasing more of its neurotransmitter into the synapse. The postsynaptic neuron may become more sensitive to that neurotransmitter, such as by adding more receptors for it on its dendrites. One way or another, if these two neurons fire together like that, if they fire at or about at the same time, then they will tend to wire together. So the synapse, the connection between them will get stronger. So the Hebb rule is a principle that does have some pretty convincing evidence in support of it. And now that you know what the Hebb rule is all about, let's apply it to classical conditioning. And guys, for the sake of this example, let's suppose that our unconditioned stimulus is going to be a puff of air that we blow into our subject's eyes. And of course, that stimulus is going to elicit blinking as an unconditioned response. So if you've ever had that glaucoma test before, when you're getting your eyes checked, then you definitely know about the relationship between this US and this UR, right? And I hate that test. But if you've never had it before, I'll tell you that apparently one way to check how at risk people are for glaucoma 
is to give them this test that involves having a machine blow a puff of air into their eyes. And obviously when that happens, people automatically respond to the air puff by blinking. So a puff of air to your eyes is an unconditioned stimulus that naturally reflexively elicits blinking as an unconditioned response. So the air puff is the US in this example, and blinking is the UR. Well, to start applying that example to stimulus substitution theory, Pavlov would say that the part of your brain that detects the air puff is innately connected and strongly connected to the part of your brain that controls blinking. And so this diagram at the bottom here is obviously a very simplified model. There would be many more neurons involved in this, but we could conceptualize that strong connection between brain centers as a strong synapse between this sensory neuron, which detects the air puff, and this motor neuron, which produces the blinking response. So there's a strong connection between these neurons. So when this neuron fires, after it detects the air puff, it causes this postsynaptic motor neuron to fire too, and so the subject blinks. Again, that synapse is already strong even before any conditioning has taken place because the air puff is an unconditioned stimulus and it elicits blinking as an unconditioned response. But now let's also suppose that we take our US, we take our air puff, and we pair it repeatedly with a tone that's initially neutral. So we're gonna present the tone, and then we're gonna present the air puff. We're gonna to go tone, air puff, tone, air puff, tone, air puff, over and over again. We're gonna pair those stimuli. And going back to our neuron diagram here, again, at first, the tone is neutral, so there's really not much in the way of a strong connection between this neuron and the auditory system, which detects the tone, and this motor neuron that controls the blinking response. So that's why this motor neuron doesn't fire when this auditory neuron does, because the connection between those two neurons simply isn't there. But perhaps there is a very weak connection between this auditory tone detecting neuron and this somatosensory air puff detecting neuron. So suppose we have a weak synapse here between those neurons. Or suppose that the first few pairings of the tone and the air puff result in the creation of that weak synapse. So that synapse, that connection here between these neurons is initially weak. But as the conditioning trials continue, as we put this subject through acquisition, what we're doing is we are repeatedly presenting the tone which causes this auditory neuron to fire. And right after we present the tone, we present the air puff, which makes this somatosensory neuron fire. Again, we're presenting the tone, and then we're presenting the air puff. Tone, air puff, over and over again. So one way to look at this is that by presenting the CS and the US together like this, by pairing those stimuli, we're basically making these two neurons fire together right? This neuron fires in response to the tone, and then shortly afterward, this neuron fires in response to the air puff. These two neurons are firing together like that, so according to the Hebb rule, they should wire together. This synapse between them should get stronger so that in the future, when this auditory neuron fires, its strong connection with this somatosensory neuron will cause that somatosensory neuron to fire too, and that in turn will make this motor neuron fire, and then the subject will blink. And so there we have our blinking response, our conditioned blinking response to the tone. And so in this way, the tone, that once neutral stimulus, could become a conditioned stimulus. It could acquire the capacity to elicit blinking by basically using this sensory neuron, using this air puff center, in other words, as a sort of intermediary. Okay, well, I hope that makes sense. Please let me know if it doesn't. But yeah, one strength of stimulus substitution theory is that it is compatible. It's certainly not incompatible with the Hebb rule, which again is a well-established principle in neuroscience. And guys, research on an interesting phenomenon called auto-shaping could also be taken as support for stimulus substitution theory. So let me take a few minutes now to talk about auto-shaping. It's kind of a neat story, I think, as far as how this phenomenon was first discovered. So the researchers who published the first study on it actually came across it sort of by accident. 
because what they were really looking for was just an easier, less time consuming way to get a pigeon to peck at a key or a disc like this in a Skinner box. So obviously, if you're interested in operant conditioning and you wanna study something like punishment or extinction, well, then you need the animals that you're studying to have a particular behavior that they're already performing so that you can try to punish or extinguish that behavior, right? So before they can begin the experiment that they're actually most interested in conducting, what researchers will often have to do first is train their animals to perform a simple behavior like pecking a key or pressing a lever. And then that way they can see how that behavior changes once they start punishing it or extinguishing it. And typically the way you'd get the animal to perform that behavior in the first place is to reinforce closer and closer approximations of it, okay? So for example, at first, a pigeon might be given food for just standing near the key. Then later, the pigeon might also have to face the key. And then later, after several of these little steps, the pigeon will eventually learn that it has to actually peck the key to get the food. So traditionally, what you'd do is you'd go through all these little approximations of the behavior. You'd get it to do things that more and more closely resemble the goal behavior or the target behavior until finally the animal is actually doing what you originally set out for it to do. So that's how you'd get a pigeon to peck a disc or a rat to press a bar or whatever. You'd go through this process of successive approximations. And that technique is called shaping. Okay, we call this shaping because it's like you're shaping the animal's behavior. You're molding it in a sense. You're sort of sculpting it. You're using reinforcers like food to train the animal to do these things. They get closer and closer to what you ultimately want it to do. So that's how shaping works. And we'll definitely spend more time on shaping later on in this course. But these two researchers, Paul Brown and Herbert Jenkins found, that they didn't actually have to go through the normal shaping procedure to get pigeons to pet keys. They found that if they just illuminated the key, if they just made it light up like this, and then followed that by presenting the pigeon with a little bit of food, well, the pigeon would start pecking the key on its own. So after enough trials like that, after enough pairings like that of the illuminated key with food, the pigeon would peck at the key whenever it was lit up. So. Brown and Jenkins called this auto shaping because it was like the pigeon automatically shaped its own behavior. The researchers didn't have to go through the usual step-by-step -step shaping procedure. And so Brown and Jenkins published their findings about auto shaping as basically a shortcut that other researchers could use to get their pigeons to peck keys in their Skinner boxes. But then of course, the bigger question became, why does this happen? <laughs> I mean, this is a classical conditioning procedure that Brown and Jenkins were putting their pigeons through, right? That food is going to follow that illuminated key, regardless of what the pigeon does. It doesn't have to pick the key to get the food. So why does it? Well, one answer to that question is that the pigeon learns to treat the key like it is the food. And of course, that's exactly what stimulus substitution theory would say. Stimulus substitution theory would say that the CS, the key, has become a substitute for the US, the food. And guys, that interpretation of auto shaping gets some support from a classic study where for some pigeons, the illuminated key was followed by food, but for other pigeons, it was followed by water. So, in this Jenkins and Moore 1973 study, the illuminated key was always the conditioned stimulus. Okay, that was always the CS. But for some pigeons, the unconditioned stimulus was food. And for other pigeons, the unconditioned stimulus was water. Now, both of these groups of pigeons did demonstrate auto shaping. They both acquired that response of pecking at the key, but they pecked at it in different ways. So as you can see in these pictures, if food had been the US, if the researchers followed the illuminated key with a little bit of grain, then the pigeon's conditioned response was to peck the key quite forcefully with an open beak and mostly closed eyes. But if water had been the unconditioned stimulus, then the pigeons would peck the key much more softly and they'd do so with a closed beak and open eyes. 
Okay, guys, this is important because when pigeons eat, they make these hard, quick pecks at their food with their beaks open and their eyes closed. But when they drink, they keep their eyes open, they keep their beaks mostly closed, and they slowly and softly dip their beaks into the water. So in both cases here, these pigeons are responding to the condition stimulus. They're responding to the key in a way that's very similar to how they would respond to the unconditioned stimulus, the food or the water. So in other words, we could interpret these results as the pigeons learning to treat the key as a substitute for whatever the unconditioned stimulus was, food or water, that got paired with it. So stimulus substitution theory gets some support from the fact that the conditioned response is sometimes quite similar to the unconditioned response, as it was here with these pigeons, and as it was in Pavlov's original research with the dogs, where the conditioned response and the unconditioned response were both salivation. However, I mentioned earlier that there was at least one big problem with stimulus substitution theory, and you can probably guess what it is. Like I told you last week, the conditioned response and the unconditioned response are sometimes the same, but not always. They're not always the same, and in fact, they're not even always similar to each other. So the CR and the UR can be quite different from one another. In fact, sometimes they're the complete opposite of one another. And that's obviously a problematic finding for stimulus substitution theory. Because after all, if the CS really is a substitute for the US, if that's what the animal learns, that the CS is a substitute for the US, well, then those animals should treat both of those stimuli the same way, right? They should exhibit the same or at least similar responses to both of those stimuli. And again, they don't always do that. So that is a big problem for stimulus substitution theory. Okay, well, that's about all I have to say about stimulus substitution theory. So I'm gonna stop this video lecture here, but I'll pick things up from here in my next video lecture by talking about another theory called preparatory response theory, which doesn't predict that the conditioned response and the unconditioned response will always be the same. And so it can account for cases where those responses differ from each other. So be sure to check out that video lecture too when you get a chance. And as always, if you have questions about anything, then please let me know. Okay, take care guys.